Um, okay, so shamanic protocols. I'm a big fan of the intake, and the other folks I talked to are as well. We want to know if you have meant, if you've been diagnosed with any kind of mental disorders, if you're on any kind of medications right now, and we want to know the degree and severity of the types of traumas that you, you know about. And this plays in, um, cascading some information forward, this plays into uh, whether they're at a point in their lives and their personal growth and development where they can benefit from shamanism. So we're looking for fit here. And this goes back to also whether the, sh what the skill set is of that shaman in their particular specialties. And the shaman will be able to go through the intake, have a brief conversation and go, yeah, I think let's go ahead and start with a session or two and see if this is effective for you. Let's try it. And if it is, we'll get into a rhythm with it. And if it's not, we'll move on with each other. Here's a, a big difference. So shamans employ skills that are, um, would be more, in the Western mind, more similar to what psychics do and what channels do. So we work with a lot of spirit guides and helpers and we open ourselves up. So when we have a client in front of us, we are actually operating with a lot of divine inspiration. And it's our job to be able to listen, interpret, really actually tremendous amounts of translation and interpretation of the information that we're getting about the client. And we may be getting information in many, many different ways. And then we compile all of that and use guidance to create a protocol for that client. Everything is a very specific case-by-case -case basis. And I have a case study toward the end of the slide deck, and I bet Gary has some really cool ones too, that will just demonstrate how different the symptom from the cure can be. And this is so interesting, and that's a difference from counseling as well, because counselors there's a lot of patterns that people fall into, and there's always the outlier cases. In fact, shamanism is a great, um, you might want to try shamanism for one of your clients that have outlier, you know, weird extra stuff going on. For the most part, a lot of traditional counseling follows some similar patterns. You know, you've seen a lot of this stuff, and we have patterns too, and then there's stuff that we get a lot of weird stuff, a lot of weird stuff, and we're good at the weird stuff, and we like the weird stuff. <laughs> We're really driven to look for the root cause. And, you know, going back to an addictive behavior, the addictive behavior is going into a traumatic event that happened in that person's time. I specifically, when I'm seeing, I, I will often see a timeline with a client, and I'll see what happened more recently, and then I'll see maybe where the trauma happened in this particular lifetime. And then I may see a, a further cause back in another, in a past life, for example. So I always go back up the timeline to the very first time that person had that type of experience or that soul had that type of experience and carry on from there. I'm always going back to the very furthest back root cause and I don't assume it's in this lifetime at all. And um, quick fix, not quick fix. Just like regular counseling, people might come in for a specific event in their life. I just went through a breakup. I want to learn everything I can about that experience and heal myself and move on. That's a short-term counseling duration. They need something for a period of time. And then there's other things like the traumas that we're talking about. As you all know, these are, depending on the age that someone had the trauma, it creates that splintering effect throughout their life. And each one of those broken pieces that has now grown up and developed itself in the broken way, all of those need to be addressed. And that can be a layer by layer process over time. People make incremental progress. I am a big fan of giving clients homework and the folks I talked to were also in that, in that part. We wanna see partnership. We wanna see the client. I, I am not the person to come to if you want me to just fix everything in your world. Like, I'm not interested in that and it's a collect. In fact, I don't feel effective that way. I ask the client to collaborate with me in their own personal growth process. I think that's essential for them to get results, especially lasting results. And then I also wanted to say that we do a lot of work on the floor. And that's because we draw energy and power from the earth. And groundedness is a huge tool in our toolkit that we use with our clients. So we oftentimes sit on the earth quite a bit. All right. 
I wanted one of my uh, interviewees really emphasized the importance of community in a person's healing process. We're such a disconnected society here in Western society. A lot of times we just don't get together. We don't feel like there's any kind of a safety net around us. And it's, it's really challenging. And I, I think this is kind of a plague in our society in particular. So I wanted to say, going back to some of those indigenous practices, yeah, we do, we've in, we create community around people whenever we possibly can. That's something Gary's been masterful at here in Austin. He's got a nice big group of people and it's a safety net. So there's guided journeys that happen in a group setting where everyone goes on the same journey with their own personal experience. Um, drum circles are another community experience. So here are a couple of protocols and we've talked about intake and identification already. Soul retrieval. So I talked about the loss of soul essence and this is when you have a trauma then a part of you checks out. You're like, ah, it ain't safe for me to be here anymore. And, and some of your energy just goes away. So it's dissociative in a slightly different way, not specifically psychological. It's, this is a spiritual loss. You're, you're not able to be fully present anymore. And again, without all of your energy here in present time, you are not going to be successful in your life. So we have several different techniques to use for soul retrieval. One of them is a journey, a shamanic journey style. Another one is the shaman goes and finds the lost piece on behalf of that person and brings it back for them. And another one is what I already mentioned, uh, the shaman will travel back in time to find where it is, heal it, and bring it back to present time. Past life regression, not all of us do this. Uh, most of us don't do this as a starting place. So there are people out there, psychics, you can answer questions about past lives if you want. Everybody was Cleopatra, actually. Everybody was King Arthur. Um, it's, it's funny how many stories there are about royalty and that kind of thing. We are all majestic in our own way. So past life regression for me and for the folks I talked with is really called for when it's called for. We don't just do it for any old reason. And in fact, it's, uh, if clients get really, really interested in finding out so much about their past lives and they kind of don't, aren't so interested in some of the other aspects of healing, then that's a form of spiritual bypassing. They're really jumping over. It's another form of addiction, actually. They're jumping over what they really need to be paying attention to because it's not so fun and happy there to the, the glory of the beauty of the spiritual connection and, oh, my past lives, oh, isn't that cool? So we don't do that very often. Entity removal. Um, I want to tell a little bit about why this, why we do this and what the benefits are. Um, as I mentioned, we are under the influence of lots of energies that we don't necessarily perceive. And that's fine and that's great and you don't really want to perceive all of them anyway and they don't really slow you down that much, mostly. When you have a trauma, uh, sometimes people can come up with a belief system at that trauma. Let's say, uh, let's say a child was hit by a male person in their life and, and they're like, whoa, and it kind of, you know, it shocked them, created a shock wave, it was a trauma, and then because of that, they're like, oh, men are, men are bad, I'm not getting around men anymore, and then so anytime a man comes around, you shrink, anytime, so, and then now you're an adult, and now you are single, and you are a woman, and you can't find any good men, the good men don't come around you. So there's a belief system ramification from that original trauma. Belief system operates like a request to the divine. Uh, I think all men are bad. The divine's like, oh, okay, great. I'll make sure that happens for you. So sometimes this, this happens. Sometimes this belief system is fulfilled as, uh, as an entity coming in to do a job. So the entity comes in and just keeps all the good men away from you. So is it an attacker or is it uh, an entity that came in as a result of an unconscious prayer? So we make unconscious prayers, I can't even tell you, a jillion times a day, probably. And we especially make lots and lots of these when we're children. And then we grow up with these and these entities continue to do their job. And then when you come to a shaman and you say, man, I am so sick of only the bad men coming around me. Is there some way we can shake this loose? And we go back to the root cause and we find the wound, we heal the wound, and there's an entity standing there sometimes. 
So we heal the entity and we say, thank you so much for playing your job. You did a great job and your job's now done. And we send you back home to be redeployed to somebody else. And that can, uh, clients can see tremendous shifts from this type of entity removal. Energy healing and enter, uh, oh yeah, curse breaking. <laughs> okay, so I've, re I've referred to curses a little bit. And uh, curses sound like, ooh, wow, only a sorcerer would do that. Oh my God, that, oh, I got attacked. Ah, I, it's not really quite like that. We curse ourselves a lot too. In the same exact scenario I just talked about, in that trauma, your energy can get really convoluted and bound up. And I have an even juicier story about curses uh, in the case study in a minute. Your energy gets really, really bound up and tangled up and inaccessible to you. That is a form of a curse. You don't have access to all of that energy. That energy doesn't free, freely flow and move. It's bound up, it's unusable, and so it's a form of a curse. How do curses happen? They happen from all different kinds of traumas, and yeah, they might be from sorcery. It's maybe 10 or 15% of the cases are from something like that, in my experience. So energy healing and untangling is a huge part of what we do. We find where these binds are, and we, have, we employ tools to release them. And then we also mentor and coach our clients in a lot of ways. You operated in the world like this. You thought all men were bad. What if you started making the assumption that all men were good. We've just shifted you. We've gotten rid of the, the being that was keeping all the good men away from you. Now it's up to you, client. This is your homework. All men are good now. You're gonna receive good men in your life. They're gonna look really weird and foreign to you, so recognize them when they come in. 